Hi, this is National Master Dan Heisman, and in today's continuing series of instructional videos for chess, we're going to talk about what I call the Mong lesson. Uh, Mong was a friend of my son's back in high school, and uh, when this game was played, Mong was a relatively low-rated player. He got to be a much better player. Today, he's a doctor. And let's take a look at what we can learn from his game. So Mong was white. He played e4, black played e5, white played knight f3, and black played the Petrovs, knight f6. <clears throat> so the number one move here is to play knight takes e5. Black will play d6. It's a famous mistake to take the pawn. Knight f3, then knight takes e4. But Mong didn't know the main line, so... He simply guarded his pawn with knight c3, which is a little bit innocuous. <clears throat> Black now has a choice of playing four knights game or three knights game. Black decided to play four knights game. And now the main move here is bishop to b5. I think the computer likes that move the best. The second line would be to play d4, break the center. And then there's a gambit line, knight to d5. But again, Mong didn't know the opening. So he played a very cautious move. The computer says it's not terrible. He plays bishop to e2. <clears throat> so black, who was about as good as Mong was at the time of the game and also became a pretty decent player later, uh, said, gee, if you're not going to grab the center and break in the center, I will. So he plays the logical break move d5, attacking the e-pawn twice. And now, what's the best way to save the pawn? Well, there's a good principle which says if somebody breaks with a center pawn and you can take it with a pawn and they can't recapture with a pawn, it's probably right to do that. And this is no exception. To play a, a bad guarding move here like d3 would be a mistake. It's better to take the pawn. So Mong does that. He takes the pawn and black recaptures with the knight. And now it's white's turn. Well, here we could use something that my friend Rich Parasot taught me, which I call the Parasot count, which is suppose we want to develop our pieces as fast as possible. If we castle, we really have four pieces developed. The king is developed because it's castled, two knights and a bishop. So we've made basically four developing moves. Black has two pieces developed plus a pawn developed in the middle. And that makes sense. White has four, black only has three, but it's black's turn. So that would be a very reasonable move. <clears throat> Instead, Mong played knight takes d5, which is a mistake. Not a big mistake, just a little mistake. And a lot of people like to do stuff like this, and they say, queen in the middle and the opening is bad. Well, the reason why queen on d5 is often bad is because if you have a knight on b1, you can develop to c3 and attack the queen. But if you don't have that knight <clears throat> because you've traded it off, then it makes sense that the queen on d5 is actually going to be a strength. And if we look at this from a development standpoint, white is moving his knight twice to take off that knight, and he's bringing the queen into the game. After castles, we said white had four pieces developed, black only had two plus a pawn. If you play knight takes d5, queen takes d5, now white will have two pieces developed and black will have two plus a pawn. So something's gone wrong. White has lost time by the Pariso count. And what's gone wrong is you move the knight twice to help the queen develop. So you don't want to do that. So in this position, castles is okay, d3 is okay, but knight takes d5 is a little bit of a mistake. Typical kind of beginner mistake. So queen takes d5, and now white should probably just play d3 to keep the black e-pawn off of his knight. <clears throat> he could play d3, and then black will make some move, and then he'll castle. And black's doing very well here, obviously, but white is in no big danger. Instead, white decided to castle first. And black looked at this position and said, well, if I move my pawn twice and hit the knight, does he have any wonderful squares he can go to, or am I forcing him to a, to a worse square? So black plays 
e4. <clears throat> All right, so let's look at this position. If you were white here, <clears throat> what would you play? So if you need to, stop the video, figure out what move you would play with the knight. Well, the knight only has two squares it can go to where it can't be immediately captured, e1 and h4. All right, well, they're both on the rim. A lot of people think the rim is only the a and the h files, but actually, for a knight, the rim is the entire edge of the board. So in a sense, if you're using knight on the rim, your future is dim, you have no choice. Both of your moves are on the rim. But if you play knight to h4, the move that black wants to look at is an AWL move. If you don't know what that is, you can look at my earlier video on AWL. Attack it with something worth less. What's worth less than a knight? Well, a pawn. So black should look at playing g5 here. And notice the knight has no safe squares now. And white will lose a knight for a pawn. Now it's true, if you play bishop to e7, and white plays g3 to guard the knight, and you take it off, <clears throat> and he takes back. The white king is very weak. This is good for black. But in general, why not win the knight for a pawn instead of trading it off for a bishop? So <clears throat> you want to look at the AWL move here for black first, g5. And if you're one of those people that says, oh, I don't want to play g5, that weakens my king side. Well, a weakened king side is a minor problem, but... Winning a knight for a pawn is enough to win a game. So you don't you don't want to weigh those two things as if they're the same. If if White had a if you were Castle Kingside and White had a whole bunch of pieces around your king, and he was going to checkmate you if you did this, well of course you wouldn't do it. But right now White's all White's pieces are back on the first rank and Black's not anywhere. So this move is going to be a winning move against Knight H4. Would it, would, would it be a good move against knight h4 even after he castles? Well, let's take a look at that. Suppose instead of playing e4, black plays like bishop to c5, and white plays <clears throat> a3, and black castles, and then white plays, I don't know, we need some innocuous move here, a4, we're just making silly moves, and now black plays e5, and here white plays knight h4, is it still a good idea to play g5 even though you're castled? And the answer is, of course. You know, you're winning the knight. Again, all of white's pieces are back on the first rank. The fact that you're weakening your king a little bit should be no problem at all if you're up a knight. Let's say what happens later. Let's say you win the knight, and white says, uh-oh, I'm losing my knight. And white goes after the queen, and he plays bishop here. And white says, ooh, there's that weakened diagonal there. Maybe I can do something. And he plays queen here. Okay, so what should black do here? Well, what black should do is trade off pieces with, like, bishop to d4 and block it, or he could just play f6 and block the diagonal. Let's say in this position, black sees that there's a mate on g7, and he says, oh, I can play queen to g6 and stop the mate, and I'm threatening h3 and bishop h3, and I'm attacking his king. I'll play queen g6. And then white goes, queen h8, checkmate. And black goes, darn, I knew I shouldn't have won that, won that knight. It happens to me every time. I, I move my piece pawns out in front of my king, and I get checkmated. I'm never doing that again. Well... You know, the reason black won the game is not because he played that really strong move, g5. Uh, the reason black lost the game isn't because he played the strong move, g5. It's because he allowed what he missed the checkmate on a, in a mate in one situation. And it's true, if that pawn was there, the white queen wouldn't have gotten to h8. But black's completely winning here. You know, if he makes a reasonable move like f6 or bishop to d4 or even maybe knight to d4 and doesn't get mated, you know, white could resign this position. So, and the reason white can resign is because g5 won his knight. So you can't ex post facto blame losing this game on the fact that you moved your g-pawn up and took off the knight and say, that's the reason I lost. The reason you lost is because white has two threats here. You need to see both of them. 
and you need to make a move that stops both threats, not just one of them. If you play poorly after a good move, you could always lose, in which case you, you could go back and point to that good move and say, you know, if I hadn't made that good move, I wouldn't have lost. But that kind of logic really doesn't hold. All right, let's go back to Mong's game. So in this position, as we say, Mong's opponent played e4. So now we're starting to realize that knight to h4 is not very safe. So what are the safe moves besides that? Well, white could temporize and play c4. c4 counterattacks the queen so that if the pawn takes the knight, then c takes d5, and then uh, f takes e2, queen takes e2 check, and black only gets two pieces for the queen, so therefore he has to move the queen. But after he moves the queen, the knight still can't go to d4 or e5 because of the knight on c6. He can't go to g5 if the queen stays attacking the g5 square, and he can't go to h4 because he gets trapped with g5. So c4 weakens the d3 and d4 squares and only temporizes against the queen. Now, if you give it to the stockfish 10, it's going to tell you that playing c4 is okay, and it really doesn't hurt white that much. But I think most players, most strong players, playing white in this position would not play c4 here. <clears throat> they probably would just move the knight. And there's only one place left to move it. They would probably go to e1. But there is one more idea to look at here, and that's the idea that was played in the game, and maybe it's the idea that you came up with too. Do you see any other moves that are candidate moves besides knight e1, knight h4, and c4 that make any sense at all? And the answer is yes. You could set a trap, and that's what Mong did. Mong played the move rook to e1. And Mong's reasoning was, okay, my knight is attacked, and if he takes the knight, I'm going to take back with the bishop check, and my bishop will be attacking his queen, and if he gets out of check with one of his other pieces, I'll take his queen, and if he gets out of check with the queen, my rook will take the queen, and I'll win a queen and a pawn for a knight and a rook. So for instance, pawn takes knight, bishop takes f3, queen e6, rook takes, don't have to take right away, but you should, bishop takes e6, and white has won a queen for a rook, a queen and a pawn for a rook and a knight. Okay, so this is tricky. There's one problem, and that is when you play chess, you need to assume that your opponent's going to make the best move, not a bad move. If you're playing someone who's above beginner here, don't you think you're kind of waving a big flag and saying to Black, hey, Mr. Black, if you take my knight, I'm going to win your queen. Because you're leaving your knight on a square where he can take it with a pawn. So anybody who's a good player is going to say, what happens if I take that knight with a pawn? They're not going to make a quiescence error and say, let me take that knight with a pawn and see what will happen. So you're basically, when you play a move like rook e1, you're telling black, if you're going to take that knight, you better be careful. And of course, black was not that bad a player. Black looked at the board, and he kind of shrugged like, what are you trying to do? You know? And he said, all right, well, now I can't take the knight because when the bishop takes back, it's check. So what I should do is block the e-file and I'd like to block it in such a way that it makes it hard on this knight. So what black did is he shrugged his shoulders and he fairly quickly played bishop to e7. Basically saying to Mong, what, you expected me to fall for that? But now Mong has a problem. He was playing chess the way you're not supposed to play it. He was, he was not assuming his opponent was going to make the best moves. He was hoping his opponent would make a mistake. Well, if you're dead lost in a position... That's not a bad way to play. When you have nothing to lose, you want to play moves that will take you back into the game. You want to play moves that will give your opponent some problems to solve, so that if he solves those problems incorrectly, maybe you have a chance to get back. But here, Mong wasn't losing. Mong could have safely played a move. But instead, he set a trap. But he set a trap in such a way that it was a negative trap. Why? Well, <clears throat> if we go back a move... The one square the knight can move to where he doesn't get trapped is e1. 
And as I was once quoted, that night move is a retreat in direction only. When people say, I don't want to retreat my pieces, well, all right, knights are not that fast. They can't move all the way across the board. So moving your knight back to e1 is not its ideal square, but it is a safe move, and the safe moves take precedence. And later on, after knight e1, you could play the break move d3 and break up what black's pawns and then bring your piece, start to bring your pieces out from there. So knight e1 is a perfectly reasonable way to play there. On the other hand, if you set the trap with rook e1 and black plays bishop e7, then you, you gave yourself a cost to the trap. The cost was that if black doesn't fall into the trap, your knight retreat square is no longer available. So after black shrugged his shoulders and quickly played bishop e7, Mang just sat there and stared at the board because now he realized that if he plays c4 and the queen goes to any safe square, it really doesn't matter where it goes to. Let's say it goes to, I don't know, d6. All the squares the knight can go to are now covered, <clears throat> which means c4 really doesn't do any good at all. It's just a temporizing move. No matter what white does now, white's going to lose the knight. And that's the price he paid for setting this trap. This is what happens when, you know, you're not losing and you make a bad move and hope your opponent plays the worst one. You know, I've had some people say, White's playing hope chess. Well, this is not what, as, as I, if you saw my video on hope chess that I made a few weeks ago, this is not what I ever meant by hope chess, but it is kind of hopeful chess. White is hoping that black, instead of playing bishop e7, will take the knight and he'll take back. And again, I never called that hope chess. For, when I say hope chess, I mean that you make a move and you don't look for your opponent's checks, captures, and threats. And then when he makes a threat, you hope you can meet it because you didn't check it out ahead of time that you actually have a move that meets it. Well, this is different. This is making a bad move, setting a trap, and hope your opponent falls into the trap. If you want to call that hope chess, be my guest. There's no official dictionary of chess. If you want to attribute that to me, that wasn't my original intention, but I'll take the credit. Sure, what what the heck? But but yes, White is hoping here. This is not hope chess, but okay, that's just semantics. But he's hoping Black will fall into this trap, and when Black doesn't fall into the trap, White's dead lost. So after Mong played Rook E1, and Black played Bishop E7, then Mong just sat there very quietly with his head down, like, what did I do? And of course, he lost this game. So you don't want to be like Mong. Let's let's go through the whole game and see how he was ended up with a losing position after only seven moves. All right, his first move of the game was great, e4. His second move of the game was great, knight f3. And now Mong didn't really learn his openings, at least not at this point of his career. And he didn't know that the main line of the Petrovs is to play knight takes e5. So he played knight c3, which is not a bad move. It's just innocuous. Black plays knight c6. And again, white should play something more aggressive like bishop b5. Or maybe d4. He plays the passive move bishop e7, b2. Again, he's not in any trouble. If we ask the computer to evaluate the position, it's going to say it's about even. But, you know, if you're white, you don't want about even. You want a slight advantage if you're playing right. Okay, black played d5. Now he played a good move. Pawn takes d5 is his best move. Black plays knight takes d5. And now he should just castle. If he doesn't want to castle, he can play knight c3. If you're one of those people that say, you know, I don't want to play d3 because he'll take my knight and he'll double my pawns. Well, yes, your pawns are doubled, but you have an extra pawn in the middle to guard a central square. You have three pawns on these two files instead of two. You have a semi-open file for your rook. It's true you have an isolated pawn, but you have something else. You have time. Black spent three moves with his knight, taking off your knight, which only moved once, which means you gained at least one tempo because it took you a tempo to recapture with the pawn. But black is losing time by taking that knight. So there is no threat for black to take that knight and double your pawns. If you castle <clears throat> and he takes and you take back, well, it's true, he could still play e4, but that's not because of the doubled pawns. <clears throat> All 
All right, so here Mong played knight takes d5, not the best move. Queen takes d5. Now black's a little better. Here white should play d3. And after d3, you know, black has a nice little space advantage. Instead, white castled. All these mistakes are small mistakes, and now black plays e4. And here, white should probably just play knight e1 and follow with d3. If he wants to throw in c4 first, that's not bad. Computer says it's okay. But one of those two moves, knight e1 or c4 followed by knight e1. Instead, he makes the losing move. He sets the trap with rook to e1. Black says, hmm, I wonder why you did that. I think Black had already seen it because I think Black took all of five seconds for his move. As I said, he shrugged his shoulders like, yeah, be my guest. You can set that trap, but it doesn't work. And Black fairly quickly played Bishop e7, a very, very logical move, stopping all those discovered checks, threatening to win the knight, and also guarding the squares the knight can move to. And now the knight has lost its retreat square to e1, or maybe we should call it its only safe square e1, since it's not really a retreat, although in direction it is from the third rank to the first. And he loses the game. So there's a lot of lessons to be learned from these openings where people make mistakes. This is one of the reasons why I tell people, you know, it's good to play over lots of annotated master games because you want to see what, what, what right is about. But you also want to play over a lot of amateur games that are well annotated because you want to see what other people do and what's bad and what's good and what you can do about it. That's one of the reasons why I wrote my book, The World's Most Instructive, Ana uh, the World's Most Instructive Amateur Game Book, because a lot of my students were playing games where they were making mistakes that other people could learn from those games. And I thought it would. there's not that many books with amateur games. There's Chess Master versus Chess Amateur, but then both sides aren't amateur. You're seeing a, a good player beat a weak. It's usually like a 2400 player beating an 1800 player in that book. So I wanted to show games where two 1600 players were playing or two 1700s or a 1400 was playing a 1700 or something like that. So I did that. And I also have, now have my amateur series here on YouTube. So once in a while, I people send me games and I go through an amateur game and you learn from that. So you can really learn from going through these games a lot about what people do wrong and how you can take advantage of it. Here, White's playing tricky. He's trying to set a trap. What he's really doing is trapping himself and losing the game. All right, so hopefully you learned something from this game. Hopefully when you play, you won't do the same kind of things. If you play an opening where you don't know the moves after the game, go to a database, go to a book, go to an engine, look up the game and say, if we had to play this game again, where would I play a better move? So if you're a Hmong here and you're doing that, hopefully you'll look it up and you'll say, oh, the main line that does the best is knight takes e5. Next time I'm not going to play knight to c3. And I'll start to learn some of these lines in the Petrovs. That's exactly what you want to do. Okay, for YouTube, this is Dan Heisman. Hope you enjoyed today's video. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.